lessons and carols and Christmas Day. If you do have an infant, uh, we, we do have a nursery today, uh, but no Sunday school, you're in here with us. Uh, don't worry, the sermon is a little bit shorter uh, to adapt for uh, the change in service order. Uh, lastly, uh, the service, because it's reading him, reading him nine times for each, uh, we're just going to go unannounced, so you don't have to listen to me announce nine hymns, and you, don't, you won't have the readers announce their readings. It'll, we'll just be singing, reading, and so forth to the end. With that, let us focus our hearts and minds on the one whom we have come to worship, and so let us join our hearts in prayer. Father in heaven, high above all the earth, creator of all that is, you sustain all things you have created by your power. There is not a maverick molecule in the universe. There is no aspect of your creation over which you are not sovereign. You are holy, holy, holy. And you are good and kind. And your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lord, we confess that we are not worthy to be in your presence, not worthy to be your children, except for the fact that your Son came to this earth, that you loved us so much that you sent him to be a sacrifice for our sin, to reconcile us to you, that we may now approach your throne of grace with confidence knowing that we come not with a righteousness of our own, but we come with the righteousness of your Son, which is given to us, which enables us to call you Abba, Father. Father, we are grateful for this season in which we remember the incarnation of the second member of the Trinity, that Jesus, who was born was in eternity the eternal word, the eternal Son. And we rejoice that he has risen from the dead and he sits at your right hand and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. And so we ask that you will help our hearts be appropriately humbled and positioned to worship you today. That our songs and readings and the preaching would all please you and edify your people. We ask your blessing upon this service and all those leading in various ways, reading and singing and so forth, that we may do so by the power of your Holy Spirit as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. 
the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this.
wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the cro crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recomp recompense of God, he will come and save you. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken.
To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my, by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God? The creator of the ends of the earth, he does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what God, the Lord, says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to, the, to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in the darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or praise my idols or praise or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you.
but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth from me one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and he shall dwell and they shall dwell secure for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth and he shall be their peace Rejoice, greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot of Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river and from the river to the ends of the earth.
I'd encourage you this morning, our primary text for the sermon is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 25 to 31. That's Isaiah 40, 25 to 31, and you've heard that read already this morning. But let us do the work of preparing our hearts to hear the word of God preached. Let us pray. Father, as I consider the things about which I will soon speak, I am acutely aware that I need everything that I am prescribing or reflecting from your scripture. And so, Lord, I pray that you would equip me and furnish me with all the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray for everyone listening to the sound of my voice that their attention would be arrested, if you will, or animated by your spirit as well that with one heart and mind and spirit we listen for your voice and are strengthened by you. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. This morning I want to talk about something that's very basic, not simply to the Christian faith, but basic to almost any and every world religion. This morning I want to speak to you about God. I recognize that people use the term God in a variety of ways. Uh, If you are a Muslim, you refer to God as being Allah. A Jewish person refers to God as Yahweh or Jehovah. And while Christians affirm that God's name is Yahweh, we also affirm that the God of the Bible is triune. That is to say that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In our day, there are a number of persons, probably you know some of them, who use the term God rather flippantly or lightly. And this is captured in the popular acronym O-M-G. There are also persons who employ the term God in a vulgar way, including God in their repertoire of profane phrases. Dear friends, the term God is not an empty cipher. It's not an empty cipher to be thrown about without any thought about what the term means. To know God rightly and to speak of him accurately is of paramount importance. A.W. Tozer, in his well-known book, The Knowledge of the Holy, begins his book with this quote, What comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes to your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Even in a context like this, I suspect there are differing opinions among us about what God is like. D.A. Carson rightly reminds us, the God of the Bible is self-defined. The God of the Bible is self-defined. In other words, my view of God does not affect or change who he actually is. Often you'll hear a person say something like, well, the God I believe in would never do that. But God is who he is apart from what we wish him to be. God is not confined. God is not limited to what you think he is. When God introduced himself to Moses, he refers to himself as Yahweh. And there's two ways you could understand Yahweh. One is to understand Yahweh as saying, I am. But another way to understand The translation of the Hebrew Yahweh is to hear God saying, I am who I am. I am who I am. 
Accordingly, what we are able to know about God corresponds to what he reveals about himself. If we presume to know certain things about God, it should be because he has told us those things in the first place. We don't get to imagine what he is like. We don't get to speculate about his nature. We worship God according to his revelation of himself. And this is why I love Isaiah chapter 40. I realize I preached on it last Sunday, but I stayed in the first half. This morning I'd like to get into the second half where God reveals some awesome things about his nature in this chapter and you'll be helped and edified if you follow with me. If you would like a glimpse of God in all his glory, I invite you to look with me through the telescope of Isaiah chapter 40 beginning at verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host, that is the stars, by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one of them is missing. The way in which God is described here is staggering. Did you know that conservative estimates are that there are nearly 200 billion galaxies in our universe? Nearly 200 billion galaxies. Now, if you research how many stars are in each galaxy, the the number varies wildly. But the average number of stars in a single galaxy is 100 billion. I don't know how to do the math on that. 200 billion galaxies by 100 billion stars. And the Word of God says that God calls each of these stars by name. And not one of these stars is missing. Every one of the 200 billion times 100 billion is accounted for. There's a great quote about Albert Einstein. It's written by a scientific relativity theorist, Charles Meisner. Meisner says, I do see the design of the universe as essentially a religious question. That is, one should have some kind of respect and awe for the whole business. It is very magnificent and should not be taken for granted. In fact, I believe that is why Albert Einstein had so little use for organized religion, although he strikes me as a very religious man. Einstein must have looked at what the preacher said about God and felt like they were blaspheming. He had seen much more majesty than they had ever imagined, and they were just not talking about the real thing. Too many of us have domesticated our view of God. Our articulation of who God is is far too small. And I include myself among those who don't think deeply enough about the nature of God as often as I ought. And yet, time and time again in the Scripture, God reveals to us what He is like, and it is breathtaking. Isaiah reminds us God created the heavens and the earth and he created the stars and not one of them is missing. Do you see the combination of his characteristics here? God is not only glorious, God is not only supreme, but he is also attentive to every aspect of his creation. 
Jesus affirms this in his own ministry, insisting that not a sparrow falls to the ground apart from the Father knowing. Jesus declares that even the hairs on our head are numbered by God. Friends, our knees may knock when we consider God's power, but our hearts should bow in humble adoration as we consider that God uses His strength and His power to assist us. That His power and strength are used to help us, to lift us up. Isaiah closes out this chapter the way he began this chapter, and that is contrasting the frailty of man with the greatness of God. The frailty of man with the greatness of God. Look at verse 28. The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. That description is very different than the description of humanity given in verse 30, where it says, Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. Ray Ortland Jr.'s commentary on this says, Human strength at its best will inevitably fail. You see, it's not enough that Isaiah said, that human beings break down and get tired or weary, that he's picturing the strongest among humanity. All of humanity, every last one of us, will grow tired. We will faint. We will fall down. So let me ask you this morning, is there a sense in which you have come here this morning exhausted, do you know what it is like to be tired? There's no shame in admitting that you are. Because the Bible promises that each and every one of us are going to be tired at some point. Maybe from the pressures you feel in your place of work. Maybe it's pressure you feel within your own home pressure from the people you live with. It may be from the burdens you carry in your personal relationships or the burdens you carry for those whom you love deeply. You may be tired simply because you're aware of the expectations that others have placed on you. You may be tired because of the expectations that you've placed upon yourself. Some of you, perhaps many of you, have come here this morning wearied and exhausted by your personal circumstances. And I want you to know that it's normal, it's natural to feel worn out by hardship. And yet here's the good news from Scripture. Though the Christian will grow tired, though the Christian will faint and fall down, the Christian need not languish in this condition indefinitely. We don't have to stay tired. We don't have to stay low, as it were. Because we have gathered here this morning to call upon the one whom, for whom nothing is too difficult. This is the everlasting God. We have come to worship a God who does not faint. We have come to worship a God who does not get weary or tired. But look at verse 29. We gather not simply before a God who has power. That would be enough to cause our worship. We don't simply gather before a God who has power. We gather before a God who gives power. He gives power to the faint. He gives to him who has no might. He increases strength.
What do you think about when you hear that? When you read that, do your eyes gloss over it? I read the promise of verse 29, and I say, I want this power. I need this strength. I don't know about you, but I get tired a lot. And I don't mean in a physical sense. Physically, I feel pretty good. Physically, I don't get tired that often. When I say that I get tired a lot, I mean that I have a tired spirit. That there are things, outward circumstances in our life that wear down, wear us down on the inside. We get a tired spirit that comes from bearing all the responsibilities on our shoulders. There is a weariness that emerges from thinking that all of the outcomes depend upon me and you. I was also reminded that we get a tired spirit from grief. We get a tired spirit from grief. Just yesterday, I learned that one of my best friends in the world died. She was also a colleague. She was my administrative assistant for the eight years I was in Toronto. Heather Carver was always a healthy, happy person. She was a strength and a joy to be around. I was feeling pretty good, feeling physically strong, but you hear the word of a good friend dying and your spirit grows tired, and I know you know what this is like to physically feel fine and yet within you is a very tired spirit because you're grieving something's missing someone's missing Isaiah promises this he says you will faint you will wear down you will grow weary because of our natural limitations, even the best of us will be exhausted, even if it's only on the inside. And I'm reminded this morning, and I preach this to myself because I need it. Verse 29 is the best news. God gives power to the faint. To him who has no might... He increases strength. We can do all the right things, eat all the right foods, do all the right exercises, but what are you going to do when things beyond your control hit you? When a loved one leaves or a loved one dies, where are you going to turn? Where's your strength going to come from? I look to the eyes and ask, where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. How do we get this? Is this magic? Is it automatic? How do we get this strength that's being offered here? Isaiah gives us the answer. He says, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Notice what it's not saying. It's not saying those who dig down deep, those who just pull themselves together. No, it says those who wait for the Lord. And the Hebrew word for wait implies activity. The Hebrew word for wait implies anticipation. So it's by faith, with a posture of readiness, we're on the lookout, as it were, for God's assistance. With joyful expectation, we pray for God's strength. We pray, we call out to Him for His deliverance, for His assistance. 
it's hard for some of us to imagine what's being promised here. Mount up with wings of eagles? Some of us just want to be able to get out of bed in the morning. You don't even have to give me eagles' wings, Lord. Just get me out of bed. Help me to be kind to people and not be melancholy or miserable. Maybe our view of God is too small. Maybe we've domesticated our view of God. And perhaps we need reminding that we have gathered before a God who is infinite. We have gathered this morning before a God who is glorious to the nth degree. We're gathered here to worship a God who not only names every star, but He accounts for every one of them. This is a God whose eye is on the sparrow, and His eye is on you. His eye is on me. We have gathered to worship the everlasting God, and our God who does not faint will be able to keep you from fainting. And don't worry, even if you faint, even if you fall down, God offers His strength. He promises His might to get you back up on your feet again. And so you need not pull yourself up by the bootstraps. The strength you require is not your own. The strength you need and I need comes from God. And it comes from God alone. I urge you, the most important thing you can do is wait upon the Lord Jesus Christ in joyful expectation, anticipating answered prayer. Wait upon the Lord. Call out to Him. Lean on His strength. The everlasting God promises. He promises to help you. All you must do is ask for help. Amen. Friends, we need help from the Lord in a variety of ways. And He has given us daily bread beyond our needs even. It is proper that we give a portion of what we have received back to Him as a sign of faith in future provision. I'd invite those who have tithes and offerings, if you wish to bring them forward to the plates at the front, you may do so now. Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit and her husband Joseph being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame resolved to divorce her quietly 
But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he, and he called his name Jesus.
Friends, as you go out from this place, whatever it is you need to get through this season can be found in God. Found in God the Father, found in God the Son, found in God the Holy Spirit. Lean upon Him this day and forever. Amen.